I used to teach in a, in a political science department that had its own t-shirt. This is before the recession, I guess. And the t-shirt said, institutions matter. Well, currently the American Congress has a 9% approval rating. You sort of wonder who those 9% are. And so it's easy to conclude that, that institutions matter. But maybe really, maybe it isn't that simple. 40 years ago, those same institutions in the United States worked pretty well. I think we can conclude that, that institutions work not by themselves, but in a context. They don't exist in a vacuum. They work in a particular historical and societal context. And so what I want to do for a few minutes is to illustrate that relationship between institutions and history and society by talking about the case of Brazil. From the time that I was a graduate student many years ago, Brazilians had a saying. They said that Brazil is the country of the future and always will be. But now, now many years later, the, the future for Brazil seems to be, seems really to be arriving. More than 20 years of stable democratic government, good economic growth, reasonably stable prices, significant reductions in poverty. Today, mo almost all the kids that are supposed to be in school are in school. Almost everybody has access to clean water. The energy outlook has become favorable. In 1973, at the time of the first oil shock, Brazil was so dependent on imported oil that the value of its oil imports equaled the value of all its exports combined. Today, Brazil is poised to be a major oil exporter. Commodities like soy feed the Chinese market. Formerly arid lands are in bloom. Brazil has survived the world economic crisis better than almost any country. So how'd they do it? Is Brazil's success a question of just getting the prices right? Did they just open the economy and let investment flow in? Well, Brazil's, government, Brazil's governments have, in fact, opened the economy, but lots of countries have adopted the kind of macroeconomic policies that, that Washington urges and have had little success. Besides, Brazil was actually one of the last Latin American countries to achieve macroeconomic stability. It never adopted the kind of privatizing reforms to programs like pensions that Washington urged. And government agencies, in particular agricultural extension agencies in Brazil, have played a major role in its agricultural development and its economic boom. So it's not the just economic policy. On the other hand, it's not just political institutions either. Suppose we evaluate political institutions along two dimensions. One dimension measures representation. How difficult is it for the various interests in society to elect representatives who will voice their concerns? The second dimension is a question of governability. How difficult is it for legislative and executive bodies to make decisions? The United States is currently pretty poor in both dimensions. Our electoral system in this country of single-member districts with majority first-past-the-post rules disenfranchises large numbers of people. Money plays a huge role in politics, and the two parties have become sharply polarized. Brazil, by contrast, is very high on representation. It's almost hyper-democratic, but it's very low, as is the U.S., on governability. Why is that? Well, Brazil's electoral system is, is proportional with many very large districts with lots of representatives. People can win seats in the legislature with very small slices of the electorate, sometimes 1% of all the votes, sometimes just a few hundred votes in electorates of more than 10 million people. The rules, the electoral rules, favor a proliferation of parties Currently, there are more than 15 parties in the Brazilian Congress. Most of them are very weak. Individualism among politicians is extreme. Party discipline sometimes minimal. Citizens cannot hold legislators accountable. There's lots of corruption. So it's not that Brazil has succeeded by crafting skillful political institutions. None of this sounds very good. It turns out that it's not so simple. Just as the US political system which currently seems so dysfunctional, once worked reasonably well, the Brazilian system, under some circumstances, seems actually to manage pretty well. And the key is the interaction between political institutions, Brazilian society, and Brazil's recent history. 
How do we understand that? Well, Brazil is a one cleavage country. The only thing that divides Brazilians is social class. You can't run for office on race. You can't run for office on social issues. In the last election, the evangelical churches and the Catholic Church tried to introduce abortion as an issue in the, in the election. In the end, nobody cared. Think about it this way. In, a, in every country, the median income is way below the mean income. And in Brazil, where the distribution of income is even worse than the United States, the median income is way, way below the mean income. So then you have a natural constituency for redistribution. Big majorities of the population will always benefit from taxing the rich minority. For elites, this creates a big problem. In a one-cleavage country like Brazil, redistribution is not something they can easily escape. Like U.S. Republicans, they can talk about class warfare, but in Brazil, no one takes that seriously. Or they can claim that the moderate left is really a radical left and will lead the country into economic ruin. And that's actually what they've done. That's what the center and the center-right parties have done for many years. They claimed that the left was really the beast in the closet, ready to lead the country into socialism and ruin. But in 2002, the moderate left Workers' Party, led by President Lula, then President Lula, won anyway. Be perhaps their most important initiative, beyond, beyond macroeconomic stability, beyond maintaining that, their most important initiative was a targeted social program called Bolsa Familia. It gives money directly to poor people. This program, it's called Family Stipend in English, this program covers 13 million families, 50 million people, more than a quarter of the population. It's about half a percent of GDP, two and a half percent of government expenditures. Single-handedly, it has reduced the poverty level in Brazil by about 10 percentage points. It stimulates demand for food and clothing, for housing, and thus it stimulates the economy. Its success contributed to Lula's re-election in 2006 and contributed to the victory of his successor, Brazil's first woman president, in 2010. Remember that the center and center-right used to argue that the left would bring on the apocalypse. Since the country under the moderate left didn't immediately go to hell, that argument no longer makes sense. But the right-wing parties, the center-right and the right, also have a historical problem. Between 1964 and 1989, a military government ruled Brazil. The right supported that military government, and so the right and the right-wing parties were discredited. So now on the right, you have what Brazilians call the direita envergonhada, that is, the ashamed right. If you were to survey congressional deputies in Brazil, it turns out that even right-wing deputies place themselves, they self-place, on the, on the left or the moderate left. You just can't quite be a serious ideological conservative in Brazil because it's a country with a particular history discrediting the right and with a particular distribution of income. And this doesn't mean that there are no conservatives in the Brazilian legislature. Of course there are. But they seem mostly interested in what, in what political scientists call clientelism, a job for a friend, a public works project for their town or for their, their political patron, a kickback on a project, and so on. They can easily be bought. The moderate left, by contrast, is pretty disciplined. Not that they don't have corruption problems, but the government can count on majority support for its initiatives when it wants it. So all this means that in this case, these perverse institutions work reasonably well. A moderate left government can govern. It counts on pretty unified support from the left, and it can buy enough votes from the center and center-right to cement together a majority. If the right were to win, the left would oppose that government's initiatives en masse, and a rightist government would still have to buy support from the right and the center. So, ironically, the claim of the center and the center-right that only it can govern, that a left victory would lead the country to ruin, is turned on its head. Only the moderate left can govern because the right has no ideological principles 
and can be appeased with pork barrel and patronage. And of course, the left is checked by one important actor, one important economic actor, that is, the international investment community. If the government messes up, investment will dry up. And if growth, economic growth slows down too much, the middle class will move to the right. But as long as the economic conditions are favorable, Brazil's perverse political institutions, combined with the nature of Brazilian society and with the country's particular political history, work just, just fine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucas. Thank you.